This is Speaking of Shakespeare, conversations about things Shakespearean. I'm Thomas Dabbs, broadcasting from Aoyama Gakuin University in central Tokyo. If you are joining us on YouTube and wish to listen to this program as a podcast, you may click the link below to your favorite podcast platform. This talk is with Stephen Greenblatt, Kogan University Professor of Humanities, Harvard University. Stephen is the author of 14 books, three of which we will focus on in this talk, Tyrant, Shakespeare on Politics, The Rise and Fall of Adam and Eve, and The Swerve, How the World Became Modern. Among many, many honors, his more recent include the 2016 Holberg Prize from the Norwegian Parliament, the 2012 Pulitzer Prize, and the 2011 National Book Award, both for The Swerve. The Modern Language Association has awarded him the James Russell Lowell Prize twice. He has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the American Philosophical Society, the Italian Literary Academy, and he is a fellow of the British Academy. This series is funded with institutional support from Aoyama Gakuin University and also with a generous grant from the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science. Stephen, we are absolutely delighted to have you join our program today and surely wish that things were such that we could have had you visit us in Japan in person. That would have been a great pleasure. I, I adore visiting Japan. Well, we still can at this time, but maybe in the not so distant future. But I would like to start anyway with your book, Tyrant. It still seems very, very new. Uh, this is in part perhaps because the pandemic has caused some kind of time warp in our minds and 2018 seems closer in time than a year or a year and a half ago. But I think really the reason is that this book, like your other books, largely uh, because uh, your other books seem new to us largely because you tend to choose topics that are of enduring interest and elemental to our lives and experiences. Now, following Shakespeare's own example, the book uh, Tyrant manages to resonate current things, unnerving things about our times without directly talking about them, while telling fictional stories set in distant times and places, uh, in your case, Shakespeare, in Shakespeare's case, uh, many other places. But you point to one small place in Shakespeare where Shakespeare lets down his guard uh, with a fairly direct and poorly timed reference to Essex. Uh, you do not let down your guard. I cannot find a place in your book where you do, but we get a strong feeling that we are reading an allegory of such, of sorts, particularly in key descriptive moments. Now, let's start with maybe a working definition of a Shakespearean tyrant and why you think Shakespeare was so drawn to depicting these types of characters and, and what makes them uh, so interesting to us. I think Shakespeare thought that a tyrant was an authoritarian ruler, but that was no surprise because virtually all rulers in the age were authoritarian, but an authoritarian ruler who didn't have his realm, his people, uh, at the center of his interests, but had his uh, his own desires, wishes, uh, his ego, his or her uh, desire for uh, for grandeur and power, independent of serving any larger common wheel. Uh, so uh, the combination of authoritarianism and arbitrary rule uh, was, I think, all he needed, I think he didn't need a kind of complicated uh, theoretical account. There, there were some available to him uh, of what a tyrant was, but uh, he meant something more. The Greeks, of course, had the term tyrant, but it really meant a kind of new ruler who didn't depend on the existing uh, oligarchical order of things. And he, he has some of that sense too, uh, but it's a, it's a more vicious, vision that he has of, of rule. Yeah, I expected when I uh, purchased a book, I expected to go straight into Julius Caesar, and you saved that to the end. And now I, after finishing, after I finished the book, I, I realized why, because Caesar is the tyrant who wasn't, and you started with the tyrants who were. 
and yeah. uh, thankfully gave us, uh, you were you went straight into Henry the Sixth series, uh, which many of us in Shakespeare studies, they, th those elements get a little bit rusty in our minds over the years if we don't teach it. Yeah, for all of us. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 is case that, it is the case some that in the case of Caesar, Shakespeare was thinking, as you say, rightly, the, the tyrant who wasn't, uh, Shakespeare was thinking about various alternative ways of avoiding this disaster. One of which, of course, it comes to mind. It's always come to mind. One of which is to assassinate, uh, kill, kill the, the serpent in its shell, as Brutus says, uh, kill the tyrant before he has the power to do the harm that he'll do. But Julius Caesar, and of course one had dreams of that, I mean, one could dream about that in the case of Hitler or Stalin or lots of other miserable characters. Uh, but in the case of Julius Caesar, at least, Shakespeare plays out the hypothesis and it turns out to be a disaster. Right. So it's, a, it's a, an interesting thought experiment. Yeah. I know you had Hero on your, on your program and he has written wonderfully about that production uh, yeah. in New York. Yeah, uh, at the theater in which in which this became very much a, a moment in the present. Yeah, and people who were disturbed by that particular uh, the production at the Delacorte, who yeah. did not think it through, right? That the uh, uh, the the people who uh, carried out the assassination, things did not end well. I think is the way he put it. it. They did not end well for those people. If you're going to assassinate a ruler, even a tyrant uh they're they're just well may be hell to pay uh i enjoyed what i really enjoyed was your focus on jack cade at the beginning toward the beginning of the book and i'll, I'll be honest with you Stephen. I, I i never was that interested in cade and his rebellion and you sort of uh, yeah i was awakened to this interesting character that you you really probe into and give us some I, you know, almost a classic uh, operational model of how the high school bully uh, rises to power, right? Yes. Through deception and lies and his own bravado. Yes. I mean, Shakespeare seems to have thought of, of him as a kind of cat's paw for York. In other words, he, he not only does he not, he does a lot of damage and harm, but he doesn't ultimately... Uh, hold on to power, uh, and he's in the fact he, he he's, he's not clearly aware of it, but he's actually doing work for someone else in the background, someone much more powerful. For York, he, yeah, for, for York, but, right? Yeah, but he is a kind of model for a certain. The reason that he speaks to us, I think, is that he's a certain. He's a model for a certain kind of uh, populism. Uh, a, how should we say, democratic populism or a populism that can afflict democratic regimes yeah. uh, where he manages to exercise large numbers of people who feel disaffected, yeah. who have reason to feel disaffected, who have reason to feel that they're, they haven't been, been respected, haven't been treated properly, uh, are outside the orbit of things and so forth and so on, who are re ready to be quite angry. The only line that any of us remembers from Henry the Sixth Part Two is first thing. Let's kill all the lawyers, yeah. and that's shouted by someone in the crowd who's been worked up by Jack Cade. Uh, but that's a very familiar, that's a terribly familiar sentiment, as it were. One, by the way, that can afflict the the left as well as the right. It's the sentiment of a certain kind of of angry populism. Yeah, I. Uh... And there's a there's another rebellion later, and I'm trying to rem remember uh, Reynolds, I believe, is uh, uh, where they were they were protesting enclosures and so, it's things like that, which would have been more of a instead of a the, the fury of a, a kind of uh, uh, what I guess now we would call a right wing populate populism. I think the Reynolds uh, rebellion was more of what we might consider a. Um, working class, uh, what the, these guys are out filling up ditches and 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 doing things to resist. And in fact, they are not exactly 
on Shakespeare's side of the economic uh, no, fence. No. In the case of the crowd who was stirred up by Cade, uh, what Cade appeals to, he appeals to a set of things, including rage at, not simply rage at, at literacy, though that is rage at literacy, um, that, that is to say he, he attacks uh, the creation of schools of, because people who talk about nouns and verbs, he says, I mean, that, that, that it's, it, these are, it's played for laughs, but it's not very funny. It, it's, it's not very funny to contemporary years that attack on education, the educational system. But, if, but link, lurking somewhere behind that attack is the fact that as people who study the period, like you will know and I know that being literate was a huge advantage in the legal system. Because if you weren't literate, you you and you committed a, a crime, a felony that uh, was a capital offense, they presented you with a text from the Psalms. Uh, they called it the neck verse. Yeah. If you could read it, you were remanded to the ecclesiastical courts, which didn't have the death penalty. If you couldn't read it, you were a dead man. Oh. And uh, you you could see that that would make the illiterate rather angry yeah uh, and yeah so shakespeare is in some deep sense mocking hostile to uh, the, the the crowd around k they're terrifying they're horrible it's a horrible phenomenon but he's also even there early in his career he's alert to why why this is going on why uh, a large number of people would follow someone so obviously ridiculous I'm going to pay, I'll, it, you can have as much beer as you want. I mean, I'll pay for it in my tour, all the rest of the, the crazy talk. Yeah. Because uh, they, they have to know that it's a lie. That, and in fact, they do know that it's a lie. They're, they make fun of him as he's talking. He says that, that uh, you know, whatever, he's a Plantagenet, and they laugh about this. Or he was a, a, a lacy, he says, yeah, your mother uh, made laces. Yeah, uh, and so forth. That's his followers who say that. So Shakespeare thought about this very strange phenomenon, which God help us, we understand. How is it possible for people to know they're being lied to and still support a populist leader? Yeah. That, uh, that's an extraordinary aspect of our lives. And yeah. I think Shakespeare thought deeply about it. Uh, yeah. Not just at the beginning of his career, but all through his career, I think he was a profound thinker about this strange phenomenon of believing something, even though you know you're being lied to. Yeah, he uh, was. I think now it's I, you, you're good on this, and I try to do this not to uh, talk too much about intentionality. Like we do not know. Uh, these actual historical figures, what their motivations were. Uh, Shakespeare, we, we're not sure what the motivations are, but over and over again in his plays, there is this sense, sense that, uh, I don't want to call it a house of cards, but there's a sense that things can fall apart very quickly if you stir up the masses and the masses are easily stirred up. So it's in the Cade part, it's certainly in Julius Caesar, uh, but it's in Hamlet with Laertes, you know, it seems absurd that Laertes could come back in and that the people would start screaming, Laertes, let him be king. But that does uh, echo the Essex rebellion, although Essex would have been from a, a noble family and, and might have had some kind of claim to the throne. But this, this was a possibility, along with uh, being vulnerable as the as Denmark is in Hamlet to foreign invasion, right? So I I think that's very strong in Shakespeare. He does not come out very strongly, or the plays don't, on the side of the the masses. I mean, it's a complicated and rich and interesting issue, Tom, uh, because Shakespeare was one of the great, maybe the greatest master in stirring up the masses. Uh, he had 3,000 people uh, in the, his theater on an of an afternoon. Uh, very, very few occasions in, in, in Renaissance England in which that many people came together were allowed to come together outside of 
of uh, the cathedral, as it were, Shakespeare is fascinated by the power that he possesses uh, and frightened by it at the same time, or frightened maybe too strong, but he's fascinated by what he can do. And what people who are masters of his rhetorical skills can do. Uh, and he thought that there was a, a, um, a link, a complicated link, one that disturbed him, I think, between his special skill and what he identifies in at least some of his figures like Antony, uh, Richard III, um, Cade, people who can stir up. Uh, I mean, as he's also fascinated by his relationship to, to, to characters like Iago or Aaron the Moor. These are in some very complicated ways self-portraits, critical self-portraits by a someone who also, or in any case, who sees deeply into what he can do. Uh, yeah. And, and, um, and there's something else, which is what is, what happens when you go to the theater? What is your contract when you go to the theater, what, when you've paid your penny? You've paid your penny to be entertained with fictions that you know are fictions, but you respond to it as truths and you experience them. You even experience them viscerally uh, as truths. Yeah. Uh, you get your heart beats fast. Uh, you you uh, break out into a sweat, you shout, you cheer, you cry. And Shakespeare is fascinated by that. You know they're fictions. Yeah, yeah. But well, he's experienced in that way. And again, he thinks about the relationship between that and, and the way in which his countrymen, perhaps he himself, are processing things that they know aren't true, but experiencing them as true. Yeah. And willing to live and die for those things. Yeah, yeah. Whether someone plucks a white rose off a branch or a red rose off the branch, and and uh, and that not being a matter of whose team you pull for, which the same sort of thing happens very frequently in sports, where people will get on one side or the other, but where people will say, "Okay, I'm on this side now, and I will die for it." Uh, heavy price. I mean, what I don't know, what what I actually don't, I can't decide, um, and I don't know where you are in this is how far this goes in Shakespeare. That is to say, whether it goes all the way down uh, to the very bottom, as I believe, for example, that it did for his contemporary Christopher Marlowe. Let's say, I think that Marlowe, the Marlowe who wrote Tamburlaine and the Jew of Malta had ceased to believe in anything. Uh, and thought that that it was fascinating that that he could manipulate people, for example, into applauding for this mass murderer, Tamberlain, uh, kills his son, um, kills the virgins of Damascus, so forth, so on. Yeah, yes, I think Marlowe was fascinated that he could do it, and I think Shakespeare was fascinated that Marlowe could do it. I think what I think Shakespeare in 1587 probably came to London yeah. and saw Tamberlain and said, oh my God. Because you can see that Shakespeare's playing is haunted by Tamberlain at the beginning of his career uh, and keeps playing with him, thinking about it until he finally tries to exercise it in pistol in Henry V, yeah. uh, 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 Jades of Asia. But I mean, that's because he, the lines were in his head. So I think that they, I mean, the question is, where did, where did the, it stop for Shakespeare? Did it stop for Shakespeare? Yeah. Are there things that he, he holds on to? And I do think there are things, but I, I think that, I think, and unlike Marlowe, and I think, but I think they're difficult to define ideologically. Yeah, they, they are. And you see in Marlowe, you know, it, with Tamburlaine, these types of people are supposed to have their comeuppance. And I've seen it argued where Ham Tamburlaine has his because we need the rise and fall. But no, he dies in the end like everyone everybody dies. dies. He, dies yeah, you know, he lives dies. old, he's powerful all the way through. In Hamlet, 
when you were down with uh, in the cemetery with those bones and those speculations about what uh, what the end is with that direct physical evidence uh you you go well okay well that doesn't seem any talk of resurrection of a, of a you know a, your body being put back together and getting your head lean body and so forth but in the next scene with Horatio he does have that line about the fall of the sparrow you know that there everything has meaning and there does seem to be a kind of reconciliation with what we might vaguely consider a a christian view of you know how to face your own death or maybe it's just a nobleman's view i mean it, it's not ruled out it's dangled before us let's put it that way i don't think yeah. it's very uh, I don't think it's underscored. I don't think that it is presented as a, as a doctrinal belief at all. And I suspect that Shakespeare was actually rather skeptical about doctrinal beliefs mm -hmm. in general. I think he thought that cruelty was, uh, was disgusting and evil. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think, I'm not sure Marlowe thought that I think Marlowe had, how should we say, a more Nietzschean uh, attitude toward it. But I think Shakespeare had certain things that he he thought no, no, uh, that that, and I do think that he he thought that the uh, that the evil characters would prey upon themselves like the monsters of the deep. That yeah. in the in the long run, uh, they. Or, or to, as as Edgar says in King Lear, uh, when you get to the very bottom, uh, there's a return to laughter. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, but you might have to wait a long time. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't. I guess we have to cross reference to the fact that Shakespeare hadn't done what we would. If Shakespeare had died at the same age that Marlowe died, there wouldn't be a lot for us to celebrate. No, uh, and okay. so he, he had a chance to grow older, and no. Marlowe didn't. He's still in pretty much an angry young man, an angry genius young man uh, phase, and he knows how to get an audience into theater. He knows how to do the spectacle, and he gives you know he he pulls out all the stops. There's no, no. doubt about it, and he he knows you, you can just. I've never I've never read poetry like that in any other English poet uh, and of many great ones. I've never read something so stirring. He just knew he had it. And yes, I agree with that. I think and I think Shakespeare knew he Marlowe had it as well. Yeah, I think yeah. That, that you can watch early Shakespeare sort of tracking, trying to figure out what he can do, uh, what he can do with with Tamburlaine. He tries to do and does in in many ways uh in uh, well i won't say in henry the sixth because i think he probably collaborated with marlowe and henry the sixth but yeah. but but he does it more in richard you can get glimpses of it elsewhere i think really in titus but yeah. what he can do with jew of malta he tries to do with merchant of venice what he can yes. do with edward the second he does with richard the second you can watch him Yes. And maybe most impressively, in a certain way, what Marlowe fabulously does in Hero and Leander, you can see Shakespeare experimenting in Venus and Adonis. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, yeah. there's a lot of that. You can well, stand, I, and then it stops. And then by by the middle of the career, you feel that the haunting, he gets, Shakespeare, I think, gets more interested in his own early career and replays certain things the way he replays Othello in Winter's Tale. Uh, but I think, but it's no longer Marlowe who's the who's the figure sitting on his shoulders. Right, right. And I do, I agree with you. And I particularly say in John of Gaunt's speech for the beginning of uh, Richard uh, Richard II, where he's talking about how he will not, you know, he's going to die while his son's in exile. And I wish I could remember the lines, but it is just stirring. And it goes dark in a way that Marlowe, Marlowe, yeah, it, at one point, it becomes a bit funny. You know, you, you can have these virgins killed and hoisted on the walls. And then he turns around and delivers his wife a sonnet about how beautiful yeah. he is. And yeah. then admonishes himself for becoming too effeminate in his, uh, exactly. you know, and, it's, you hard, know it, it's hard to say, are you, are, are you supposed to, I mean, a little bit to our, to our ears, it's like hearing Hitler just talk about how moving Ava Braun's smile is to him. You think, <laughs> what? I mean, he just killed a whole bunch of people in town. Yeah. Uh, but but um, 
it's hard to know what they thought. It's hard to know what, what Marlowe thought he was up to. It's hard to know what the audience in 1587, except that they thought that Edward Allen, the actor, was the best thing they'd ever seen. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and that the verse, as you said, the verse was just overwhelming. I mean, like for them, like hearing Beethoven, like hearing uh, something just fabulously strong. Uh, well, I'll give you an example. I uh, have uh, graduate students who are Japanese. They're in a second language. So this is super tough stuff for them. But we were watching in one of those old BBC versions uh, of Edward II. And my students were getting it. We had subtitles. But that prose, it isn't as naughty as Shakespeare. Shakespeare can lose, well, lose me in a moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because he does get a bit, I don't know if the word's Baroque, but you know, he's a naughtiness and he'll string two proverbs together, known proverbs and work it out over about what, six, eight lines. And you have to keep the first thought in your mind as you go through. Uh, whereas Marlowe doesn't tend to do that. It's pretty much straight on. Uh, well, we've, uh, we've moved away a little bit from tyrants and f I, I like this, but we haven't because I noticed in tyrants that you, there's a kind of return to Shakespeare and you, and I know you've been doing uh, editing in Shakespeare, you know, you you have those involvements all the way through, but in terms of a direct, um, Stephen Greenblatt reading Shakespeare, uh, it, there's a kind of return there. And uh, I, I think it was provoked by certain changes in our political climate in the States and also globally, and certainly in Europe and, um, and in various countries across the world where we, where we, were, um, we were unnerved, we were shaken a bit. It, it's very hard if you're someone like me, I won't speak for you or your students, but if you've spent your life as I have uh, inside, with your head inside these plays, then actually the world, you begin to look at the world through them. So that, that when I see, this was well after I wrote Tyrant, but when I see a certain leader sitting at a polished white table uh, uh, alone, 30, 30, uh, 30 feet, 10 meters away from the person whom he's talking to, I think, what? And I think, I get it. I get it through Shakespeare. Yeah. I I understand what that when I see that same figure talking to his intelligence chief and bullying him in a kind of shocking way, I I say that that's scripted, that's straight out of Richard the Third, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so forth. I mean, it's hard not to think that way if you are me, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> you, you spent as much, many years as I have doing this. I don't think it covers the whole ground. I mean, no one does, but I do think it covers a lot of the ground. Well, I, I have to say at this point, I learned from you uh, two things from you uh, years ago. And the first thing was I can do what I want to do. Uh, there, there was a daring uh, there that, uh, you know, in my generation coming from the American South, we were still uh, treating literature in a Cleanth Brooks sort of way. And I have an enormous amount of respect for Cleanth Brooks. He was one of my teachers. Yeah, I, uh, I was wondering, I, I was cross-referencing. and wondering. Ian, Robert Penn Warren, both. I yeah. what, what, what a stirring, I mean, and they were, you know, they, they were, um, uh, oh, people said, uh, they're new critics, they, they don't want to face up to the history of their own past and that sort of thing, but they were very historical also. But they were extraordinary people. I got to meet Clan Brooks once, and he was just such a gentleman, yeah. and uh, and uh, just a, a wonderful guy. And he had wonder. But we were taught in that kind of new critical way, and we were discouraged unless we wanted to go into bibliography, which that was only for people who couldn't do scholar uh, couldn't do criticism, right? You know, you had to go to the scholarly route. And then you come along here, and you're saying, okay, no, we can do this. Uh, we can attach things to uh, to historical events, and we, in a way, must. Uh, it is incumbent to do this sort of thing, to for us to be able to understand the dramatic tensions that we're we're seeing here. Uh, if there's a, if there's a ghost in purgatory, there's a whole bunch of people out there who uh, are being told there is no purgatory, and that. Ratchets, it ratchets the whole thing up. And people who believe in purgatory are maybe uh, under suspicion. Uh, yeah. 
And no, I mean, you're, you're right that, I mean, I, it's, I, I won't claim much for myself, but, but I do claim for my particular moment, my generation, I was absolutely saturated with, wonderfully saturated with new, criti new criticism at Yale in the early 1960s that my teachers were uh, Cleanth Brooks and Robert Penn Warren, Maynard Mack. Uh, yeah. These were the giants before the flood of, of, uh, of new criticism. And then I went to England as a Fulbright uh, and I was completely, the French would say, bouleversé, knocked over uh, by someone named Raymond Williams, my tutor for a while. And I went to lectures by him and they, they had a relationship to, how should we say, reality as I was thinking of it in the mid 1960s with the war in Vietnam uh, beginning to heat up and the, uh, the a kind of generational insurrection taking place of which I was part. I just thought, I can't simply stay inside the text any longer this way. Yeah. When I went back to Yale for graduate school, um, I, I had read Sir Walter Raleigh in, when I was in England, uh, Raleigh's poetry. Yeah. Uh, it was a very small body of poetry, but it's quite interesting. It is. Uh, and I was amazed by it, and, I, and partly because to me it sounded like T.S. Eliot. I thought, how is this possible that he was writing this way? Yeah. And given his life, uh, a monopolist, a uh, conspirator, uh, an explorer, a, col a, a colonialist, um, a, a historian, a skeptic, a crazy set of things. And so I went when I was when I wanted to do my dissertation, I went to actually a remarkably wonderful, brilliant man, uh, Jeffrey Hartman, yeah. and I asked him if he would be my my tutor, my advisor, dissertation advisor. And I described what I wanted to do, which was to talk about how someone with that kind of life could have written these poems. Uh, and he looked at me like I had. Uh, I won't say it. I mean, like I had done something very offensive. Yeah. And he said, if you want to do that kind of dissertation, you have to do some kind of textual scholarship. Uh, you should. So exactly as you say, Tom. Uh, and I understood that I was being, he was suggesting that I move to the hydroelectric plant in Ulan <laughs> I, I wasn't. I wasn't fooled by this suggestion. I understood what he meant. Uh, and so I said, thank you very much. And I found somebody else to direct my decision. I mean, so, uh, because I, did, I, couldn't, I couldn't stay inside the box anymore. Even though the box was wonderful, I loved it. I'm so glad that I was trained that way. They trained you how to read and they were exactly right on close reading. It's just that it doesn't have to be within the parameters of this play. And the, and the more we learn about these plays, of course, uh, three, three early versions of Hamlet and so forth. Where, where are we? When are we inside or outside the play? And it's always leaking. And uh, if you're reading uh, what Faustus, you, you have to know something about the, uh, uh, the Holy Roman Empire and what was going on there with the uh, uh, slapstick comedy in the middle of that play and the uh, uh, yeah. image of, I, I think, uh, Frederick uh, Barbarossa, the uh, uh, kind of inversion of an of, of an image there, but uh, you, but you, you also I mean, for, me, for me, Tom, all everything you say is absolutely true, and I believed it, I, I still believe it passionately. But I also wanted to be in touch with the here and now, with who I am right now in this place, yeah. with what's going on around me. Uh, so that that what to me is fascinating, or, I mean, what what has been fascinating for now decades, is somehow having in play both the historical past, the past in, in 1603, or the past in, that's being referred to back from 1403 in the, in the 1603 play, but also to have right now, and not to pretend that I'm living in some kind of weird abstract place in which that doesn't count. If I'm anxious about what's happening in Ukraine, I can't block it out when I'm reading Troilus and Cressida. Yeah. I'm, I'm oh. pretend that it's Troilus. not happening. Yeah. That and play. I want to figure out how to, how to use my 
anxieties, yeah. my fears, my desires, how, how to use those in understanding, as they say, drugs and Cressida, but also how to use drugs and Cressida to understand what's happening now. I, I don't write about drugs and Cressida and Tyrant, as you know, I'm just no. using an example. No, but uh, I, Hector and the, that speech, uh, they're, they're in court and Priam is uh, presiding and they're, they're giving all the reasons why not to do it. And they're very, and it's exactly, and at the end, that should be kind of, okay, we can't fight these people. And they say, okay, let's go. <laughs> because they, <laughs> they, know, they know the whole time, you know, that they're going to go fight. They have to. Yeah. That's what they're born to do, apparently, right? So just uh, amazing stuff. Uh, I am, I am to this day still amazed at the number of people, though, who very strongly uh, are opposed to historical understanding of uh, old text, Shakespeare in particular, that there still is this, I, I remember, you know, 30 years ago or more, the, a, a very strong pushback. You know, there was a, that th these were well wrought urns and they were not to be tampered with in these ways, but it's still out there. Uh, well, there's, if there, if there was something that was in the origins of new criticism, something liberating about precisely that. You don't have to spend your life in the musty archive. You can experience it, the well wrought urn just for yourself right now. I, re I respect that. I just felt that I was suffocating. I mean, if you're not suffocating, if you're happy there, I mean, you know, that's fine. I don't feel belligerent about it in the slightest. I, I, I think that, and you don't actually have to know about uh, the changes in the theology of the 16th century to enjoy Hamlet, even though the theology, the, those changes, the change that, that is marked by, in the burial service, by the difference between saying, uh, we commend your body to the earth, and instead saying we commend his body to the earth, mm -hmm. everything that's marked by that change from an I thou relationship to an I him or it relationship, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the closing of the, the boundary between the living and the dead, the play is saturated with that. But if you don't know that, it doesn't matter. The play is great. The play is fantastic without it. I mean, I'm not, as they say, I don't want to beat someone over the head with this historical stuff, yeah. but I love it and I'm fascinated by it. And if you, if I can do something with it, if we can do something with it, if, for example, if we're putting on the play or trying to understand the play, that's great. If yeah. we can't, the hell with it. Yeah. Well, I'm being a little bit, you know how we are. You have these successes in your career and so forth. And you go, okay, what the things won are done. And what you remember are, are failures or things, or rejections or uh, some, you know, being uh, overlooked or whatever. But I remember one rejection years ago that, said, uh, that uh, the reader said, uh, we're, we're not learning how to read the play. We're not, this doesn't show us how to read the play. And I was, I wanted, this doesn't, I wasn't talking about how we read the play. I was talking about how the play understands us, understands yeah. us. And that is that audience and us. And through that, we get an understanding, you know, what is this, yeah. how does Hamlet speak to us uh, yeah. through these, let's say through these bones? What, yeah. how is he speaking to a society of people That's who had exactly to right to step me. over? I mean, you know, step over bones on their way to work or their way to church, right? Uh, and um, you, you have to you have to be willing in to put up with people saying no or pushing back. I, if I took my shirt off, I'd show you many scars uh, <laughs> that I've had from. I mean, you know, so it's like Coriolanus. Uh, yeah, that's fine. It's fine. I survived yeah. them. I mean, you know, the the uh, the when I published now. A very long time ago, more than 40 years ago, I published a book, Renaissance Self-Fashioning. That might have there might have been the longest and most hostile review of my entire life in the TLS uh, from that that basically said I should be driven out of the profession. So, you know, I, I didn't enjoy it, uh, but I, you know, took it in stride. You have to take this stuff in stride. Otherwise, you don't mind. You wind up just imitating everybody else. Well, you hear those voices, you don't hear uh, the silence. And that was a whole generation of us who said, we can do this now. 
we have a path, right? And uh, and I, I don't l- like to do that, but I mean, we owe you a lot. We owe you, many of us, uh, because you took that, uh, you took that heat. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and we were after that, then uh, journal editors and other editors and also people in conferences and so forth became more open-minded t- toward the, because uh, there are a lot of people out there who wanted to do it but uh, probably couldn't, you know, you can't get past the uh, guardians of the gates and, uh, and the gates opened up a good bit. And of course, they, now it, they, yeah. they opened up a lot. I mean, part of that had nothing, some of maybe a little had to do with me, but a lot of it had to do with the, the times the, 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 there were lots of jobs in those days. There were lots of, there was lots of movement in the profession. There were amazing things percolating and happening in Paris. Uh, that were changing our views of things and so forth and so on. I mean, it was a, without, I don't want to sound like Wordsworth, uh, uh, bliss was it then to be alive, but it was fun. Uh, A lot was happening. And uh, uh, I mean, a lot that was unpleasant as well, but the, but it all went together. I mean, it was exciting. It's wonderful stuff, Stephen. I could go on and on. I want to kind of uh, pivot a little bit here, uh, pr- primarily because about 20 years ago, I put it in, uh, I mentioned this in another, in, several, in a couple of other talks, but uh, our, the, the person who was teaching the Bible at our university uh, retired. And uh, we had a Miltonist on staff and she did not want to take over the Bible. It was just too much. And she was, she wanted to stay. And she came to me and said, uh, okay, you're from the American South. I said, well, yeah, I grew up there. And she said, well, so you, you, you have Christianity down and you do Shakespeare. So the King James version, it should be no problem. I said, well, I, yeah, I guess you have it. <laughs> and she was my senior colleague. This was 20, almost 25 years ago. And, uh, was this in Japan? Back? Yeah. In Japan. Yes. And, uh, so, I took on this Bible course and I had no idea what I was doing. I was the worst possible imaginable teacher the first year uh, I, because I thought, okay, let's do Old Testament first semester, New Testament is a year long class, second semester, which was idiotic because 75% of the Bible is Old Testament. And, and, and I, I just completely, and, and so I realized I had to retrench, but anyhow, uh, for 20 years, I've been the Bible teacher here. And so wow, you're... Yeah, your work on Adam and Eve has, uh, I was looking at, you know, your your view of it, and so much of your view, you have this kind of fresh, you know, looking, go, going outside the myth a bit, and looking from outside and historically, and I'm go, I go into a class of students, maybe half of whom, they've heard of Adam and Eve, but they have no, they, they're not, they don't know the story, most of them. I mean, the, the you're story. in a very un- privileged position, because precisely yeah. by virtue of of being in Japan, I mean, because yeah. your your J- Japanese culture is, I mean, plenty of people will know, and there are plenty of Christians and plenty of C- people will know the Bible, but many people will not, and it won't be a surprise that they don't. So that's fascinating. Under what circumstances the people, large numbers of people take as true what at least appears to be, and what I actually, in the case of the story of Adam and Eve, know to be fiction. Uh, I mean, it's a, a story that doesn't, in a way, conceal its fictionality. It's a story that involves a, a magical garden, naked people, a talking snake, uh, that has all the elements of a, of a fiction, of a myth, and have no desire to play the village atheist mm. uh, in the story, but I, in, in the book. But I'm fascinated by how it is that this story, which has so many of its fictional elements right up front, became true for millions of people and still true for millions of people. Uh, so it has the same fascinating problem that, uh, that we started by talking about with Shakespeare, with what, what is the willing suspension of disbelief about? How is it that people can get beyond the disbelief that the story invites you to have? I don't know, but I do know over years of teaching, you know, you start out with, it's okay, it's, it's funny. And there is some humor in the story. And I'm not so sure that it, and they, an original kind of intention, you know, we're talking to a bunch of people, most of whom can't read uh, whatever uh, we have here, whatever language is in, and uh, we need to keep them entertained. It's a kind of uh, uh, comic book or manga in Japan, uh, maybe. 
but then you go and say, well, what is this knowledge tree of the knowledge of good and evil? If you are absolutely innocent, you don't have that knowledge and you don't have any knowledge really, right? And so Apple computer, somebody was brilliant. I don't, you know, with that bite, computer bite and the bite of the apple, you know, you know, there is a kind of sense of being bad, you know, uh, by getting into the computer and learning more. Uh, it, it, there's a strain there that is extraordinarily true about human nature. And you point out the difference in the two myths, you know, the Genesis one, which carries over to, I think it was the Geneva editors who put the uh, chapters in. I know they, I think they did. Yeah, they did chapters, I believe. But anyhow, they carry over the first story to the second chapter in order, I think, to create a sense of continuity, which there absolutely isn't yeah. in terms of how things were created from one chapter one to chapter two. I'm with certain, certainly two different writers and at a yeah. different period of times. Uh, what 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 interests among many things that interest me uh, uh, about I mean it's strange to spend a, to write an entire book about just a few verses basically in the Bible. But one of the things that fascinates me is as, as I write about that the earliest uh, trace that survives of the story comes from people uh, because of what survived in the desert, people who believed that, that the serpent, that the snake was the hero of the story or possibly Eve was the hero of the story because, because you shouldn't be ignorant of good and evil because being yeah. kept ignorant is actually not a good thing. No. And no. so that, that's from 2000 years ago, people yeah. thinking, interpreting the story that way. That to me is completely fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, it isn't all just uh, do what you're told to do or else, you know, that can't be where we end. Uh, and over the years, I, you know, I used to point out, okay, they're two different. Uh, and I have some uh, probably residual resentment of people who uh, pers persistently in the South tried to convert me to whatever church they're part of. And it, there were very different takes on it. And, uh, and sometimes they got a little bit uh, um, too, too strong. But um there is a God of the cosmos in the first chapter. And in the second chapter, there's a God of earth. And in it's two different ways, even though they may contradict, they explain two different things about who, who those people are, maybe who we are, that we need. They fill in the blanks. You know, what is the cosmos and what is the earth? And how, and why, you know, of course, why do we experience pain? Why do we have to work? Why is life hard? Uh, childbirth. Why do men, why do men, uh, attempt to, to dominate women. That's one of the oh yeah the subjects oh, yeah. of the of the curse, as it were, uh, that that uh, God gives uh, as a result of this. That women will be well. To me, again, totally fascinating. It's a piece of thinking uh, that that the woman will be dominated by the man, and that she will she will continue to desire him. Yeah. That paradox that that from three thousand years ago, whenever the story originates, that that um, you know that still has some uh, way of speaking to us now. Yeah, yeah, it does, and of course, all of the art, and and like you, it always just surprises me. She, he says, eat the apple, and she does, and hands it to Adam, and he does, and it's that fast. And of course, I'm thinking maybe through the prism of Milton. I, we had to study Milton when I was in school. Milton takes that way out, you know, Adam, you know, uh, thinking it through. Do I want to be with her? Do I want to be with God? And, and, you know, it just is this raw. Who called it? Was it, uh, was it Blake? I don't know. The Great Code, uh, the well, Bible. Oh, you know, yeah, all, the, Northrop Fry. Northrop Fry called it the Great Code. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and called, I think Northrop Fry, I don't know if he was quoting someone else, what Revelation, the book that either finds someone mad or, or leaves him so. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but you, yeah, you do have to keep it there. But what, what, a, what a fine book. Now, that was a little, that was 2017, and it's still right now today. Um, uh, you really made a splash uh, about 10 years ago with the swerve. And I wanted to, to let you know that I heard, uh, who is it? Glenn Lowry at Brown, who's an economist and kind of socio socioeconomist, was talking on a major podcast and brought up your book because he was asked about his view of death, right? And that's, that's where 
Lucretius just yeah. throws this whole thing out in a way that surprised me. I had to study Lucretius and I'm going, oh, we don't have to be worried because it is the end. And I thought it was, it, you know, you worry because it is the end, you worry, right? He turns that around. Yeah. And I never got I mean, over that. I mean, it's interesting that, that uh, uh, that's fascinating uh, to, to be able to get fully, as it were, in the spirit of that remarkable claim, I mean, beautiful and powerful claim that the Epicureanism makes. Uh, I, I sometimes am there, but I'm sometimes with, with Cicero, uh, who, who says, of course, you know, that Lucretius says that, or Epicurus in this case, Epicurus says that, uh, that when you're dead, you're dead, there's no further life, and that's good news. And Cicero basically says, that's good news? That that's that that's where's the good news part of it? Uh, uh, a little bit I have some of that sense uh, in in me sometimes that that being told that it's really over and that you will be redistributed, your atoms will be redistributed, which I believe is the case. Yeah, uh, it, it seems it, to be. Yes, that's it. Yeah, yeah. is. Um, you know that it's hard to hold on to that as uh, a very calming uh, revelation, though that is it's meant to be somehow to take you to a place in which you're no no longer in the grip of anxiety, you're no longer in the grip of of the myth mongers. <sighs> I mean, as I get older, I try to to, to achieve that kind of ataraxia that that uh, calm uh but it's difficult it is difficult it is difficult because it's built into our dna or psyche or whatever to survive it is yeah. that that is the that's that's and, instinct number one uh i've never understood suicide i've just never understood it you know uh on that regard why would you want to end things i suppose i suppose if it's, yeah. it's only we we're we're nature has been merciful to us so far because I suppose it becomes comprehensible if life becomes intolerable, but it's not intolerable at the moment. Uh, yeah. And that's been for me. I love, I love life. I love my life and I love life and I want to hold on to it and in, intact as long as I can. Yeah. But when I go, I would like to go um, accepting in a way that, um, that Lucretius urges you to accept that yeah. it's actually, it's fine. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, I, I wrote a, that book, as you know, uh, now some years ago, but Lucretius's great work on the nature of things ends, of course, with an account of the pandemic. Uh, and and it, it's a way of testing, in effect, I think it's a way of testing the reader uh, to how much you've managed to get the point yeah. which is that there are, first of all, the point being that there are invisible forces that are not being sent by angry gods that are part of the structure of the, of the atomic structure of the, of the universe, that there are these invisible agents that may make you sick and may make many of you die. Yeah. And that you, it doesn't urge you simply to accept it and not put on a mask. Yeah, but it does it does urge you not to have to take how should we say a theological view of this, not to think that the, you're being punished, but to think that uh, you need to understand that you're living in a universe with other living things, including microbes, yeah. uh, and you have to yeah. figure out how to protect yourself in this case. Yeah, yeah, those how microbes can turn your, against you. Yeah, how to protect your society? How to protect your society from falling apart? Because that's what it really ends with. Well, that's it. That's the Old Testament. There was almost a, revel a revelation, kind of a um, Pauline type thing when I'm going, wait a second. This is all about keeping things intact because life is short. We don't know. We don't know the hour, but we do know. And I, I think that we don't have this as much, you know, this absolute, not only our own our own survival, but the survival of our species, let's say our tribe, our group, uh, becomes the most important thing. 
and a God is formed for that and rules are formed for that and to, for generations after generations, right? And the, the importance of be, being the father of a great nation. You know, if God appeared to me and said, you will be the father of, a, of many nations, I'd go, so, so what? You know, I, I'm proud. I, I'm a father. I like being a father. I like that I, you know, might continue in that way. But look, Tom, there's, I mean, we're getting it with these are complicated and deep and uh, rich subjects, some of which are definitely above my pay grade. Uh, but I would say a couple of things. One is that, that the Bible, though not in the form that you put it, but the Bible's vision of multiple generations raises, a, I think, a profound question that is with us now today, which is what is our obligation, what is our ethical obligation to generations that are not yet born? Yeah. If we are destroying the environment, but we'll be okay, and even our children and maybe our grandchildren will be okay, but some generations further down will not be okay. Yeah. What is our ethical relationship to that? And you can see that the Bible's account, as you say, we dis distanced from being the patriarch of, of this, but the Bible's account raises this, this question in a powerful way. And at the other side, turning it around back to Lucretius, I think there's a real problem in Lucretius that is not resolved. I think that it is a problem that, that has been perceived before, well, certainly in the 20th century, but earlier already in Hume. Hume, uh, yeah. Already sees this is a problem. Why should you think, if you believe Lucretius, mm -hmm. why should you think that life is better than non-life? Why should you think that Human life is better than the life of the uh, coronavirus. Yeah. What 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 is the moral difference yeah. uh, on which you're making that judgment? Yeah. And I think that I don't think Lucretius actually has an answer, or Epicurus has a very clear answer yeah. to that question. Yeah. And it's one of the reasons that I'm how should we say ninety percent on board with uh, Epicureanism, but not a hundred percent. Yeah. On board. Yeah. Because I, I want to honor my belief, not that my life is so important, but I want to honor my belief that my beautiful granddaughter's life yeah. uh, is more valuable than the life of the coronavirus. Yeah. Uh, and I won't accept a, a philosophy that doesn't make clear to me that to honor that feeling yeah. in me. Yeah. And her grand and her granddaughter's life also. Oh. That that's that's interested me because for years I've asked students about uh, they know their fathers, they know their grandfathers, and they can say, well, my grandfather did this job, uh, or grandmother did this job. Most mostly it's through the father because they worked, and particularly in Japan. Uh, but when you get to great grandfather, nobody knows. Right. Uh -huh. I happen uh -huh. to be kind of rare. I know who my great grandfather was. Uh -huh. Of course, being from the American South, you sometimes don't want to know too much. But uh, the uh, and their lines that, you know, br branch off from the uh, paternal and uh, uh, the uh, uh, maternal side. And uh, so from the uh, patrician and matrician side. But the uh, the thing is that 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 amazes me in the Bible where there is this extraordinary urge, very in ancient peoples to keep a record however accurate it is to keep the record uh and we see it appearing again in shakespeare uh bringing back those records because who wants to sit down and read hall or hollandshed but if you make a drama out of it you know uh yeah. you you uh you bring it back into the in into the consciousness just like lucretius was brought back in you know i want to say by the way just about the the, the story you just told about which is fascinating about uh, your students and their grandparents. This is something you wouldn't do in Japan. It wouldn't make sense to do in Japan, I think, with your students, but I do routinely in my classes. I ask the students what language their maternal grandmother spoke, mm -hmm. or ideally the maternal great-grandmother, but I just ask maternal grandmother, usually. And there, because it's the United States and not Japan, you get this absolutely extraordinary 
rainbow effect. I mean, just an extraordinary number of different languages. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. different traditions. So it gets you off the biblical patriarchy where, where this line, this ethnos, that is, it, it's a whole set of different peoples, languages, backgrounds, uh, all mixed together. Yeah, it's sort of Tower of Babel in reverse. <laughs> Uh, that you bring back. Uh, it, it has, uh, viewing my children, it, it has amazed me of how quickly, it's one generation, and certainly two, uh, that uh, uh, say flying back to Tokyo and, and in my case, sitting beside a, uh, a young uh, Japanese guy, 90% of the plane are Japanese, and I speak to him in Japanese, and, and he says, I don't speak any Japanese. I, I grew up, I'm, a, I'm from California. I'm going back to see, <laughs> I'm going back to see my grandmother and we can't communicate, but she cooks good food and, oh, and uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, so that does amaze me in the Bible, how you can keep a language together for so long. Uh, yes. And even, uh, and I think you, uh, I've read in your biography, you uh, were brought, you were Jewish. Uh, I was brought up Presbyterian. I think that there are some crossovers in a strange way in terms of uh, you, there's this great image of your book of opening your eyes during a, a kind of Passover event, you know, in the temple, right? And nothing happened. Uh, yeah, the, it's the, 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 the blessing at the end of the, the blessing service. where, yes, yeah. you, and you can't look or else you go. Yeah, My, I, I, it's not part of the the liturgy that you can't look, but it was part of the, how should we say, folklore yeah. that you couldn't look. You had to close your eyes, bow your head, because God was passing through the synagogue, and you would die if you look at God face to face. Yeah. Uh, and I steeled myself, it took me weeks uh, to force myself to open my eyes, willing to die for the sight of God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Afraid, I didn't. That, that moment... It, it is it is amazing childhood experiences uh there is the um well i think i'm uh pulling it from something i read historically in the 16th century but the notion of the second childhood that besets people when they get to a certain age uh and i and i'm feeling it now where you you you're more inclined to look back to childhood and the dynamics of childhood and take it uh, maybe perhaps more seriously and you, in, in your book, Returning to Tyrants, there, it almost seems like an, uh, an elementary or middle school uh, type behavior that it takes over, you know, people trying to um, uh, develop, there's a child, childishness in the tyrant, and there's the childishness, <laughs> and the complicity that allows the tyrant to be the tyrant. Well, there is, a, yes, you've been, one of the reasons that these that these works continue to speak to us is that even though the political arrangements have in many ways are all profoundly different and the cultures are different and so forth, is that there are certain traits. I think that Shakespeare that also goes back to questions of your the possibility of going back and getting something that you've lost from your childhood. I think Shakespeare was obsessed with that uh, very early on. I mean, already from Comedy of Errors, an early play, all the way through to a late play like Winter's Tale, where he's yeah. fascinated by the possibility of getting something back that you've lost. That's right. Getting That's right. the thing that, that was once yours, whether it was the mother or father you've lost or the wife or the wife. spouse you've lost. I mean, that getting it, is it possible to get it back? And that, that, that notion of a, of a second chance in life <clears throat> is something that it cuts in two different directions. It, you know, it, it's an infantile feeling. Yeah. But it's also a mature feeling. It's the, the desire not to lose the thing that was at the beginning of your existence. That yeah. shaped you when you were young. And I think Shakespeare knew that in himself. I, oh, he knew yeah. it when he was, when toward the end of his career, I think in a very deep way. Yeah. Well, the evidence we have of him wanting to uh, have a coat of arms, uh, a memorial of, of some sort uh, that <clears throat> points to a kind of recreation. You know, he wasn't born to it, but he earned it. And you could in his time earn it. Ra Raleigh earned it uh, and uh, Drake uh, earned it, you know, and I'm, you know, dadgummit, I'm the uh, I'm the dramatist. I earned it. You know, I did this. 
he's ironic about it at the same time, and he makes fun of it in Winter Sale, but uh, he also does it. Um, so, anyway, I think it's true that the the uh, for for all of us, I mean, I've always tried to hold on to. I don't feel it's an old age phenomenon. I've always tried to hold on to some sense of where I came from, who I am. This is relevant, I think, maybe to you, to perhaps to your you and your your students who are so remarkable at being able to read Shakespeare in English. You have to have an unbelievably uh, impressive command of English to get to make any sense of it at all, even as a native speaker. But I think that what I tell my students at Harvard and at Berkeley, when I where I taught for many years, if their student, that's why I have that exercise about what your great great what your grandmother spoke, what language she spoke, hold on to the fact that you're not to the manner born. Hold on to the fact and yeah. use it. Yeah. It's important to use it. Don't, don't try to pretend that it's not there. Yeah. Try to exploit yeah. it. Yeah. Try to, to honor it. To understand that your difference is actually part of your skill. It's a gift. Yeah. Yeah. That for me was hugely important not to be frightened by the fact that my grandparents didn't speak English as their native language, uh, that is important to hold on to, not to be uh, ashamed of, and not to try to erase. You learn this course as much as you can. You try to become as comfortable as you can in whatever it is that you're studying, but you don't try to erase your origins. You try to draw upon them. Shakespeare never loses the works for childhood. Yeah. He he exploits it. He's writing out of it at the end of his life in the Winter's Tale and in the Tempest. Yeah, well, he so, yeah, it's full of noises. He did have to go up against Marlowe, was a Cambridge graduate and a gentleman as a result. You had as an estate when you were, and I tell my students when you graduate from this university, that's an estate. That's that's a possession. You reach, you know, traditionally a level. You have that degree. That's, and uh, Marlowe had it and Shakespeare didn't. And um, uh, so there were those who did and those who didn't. And I think he probably felt that acutely. Uh, yeah, in, in the, you know. But he didn't, but there are ways of feeling it and ways of feeling it. And he got the estate, as, as you say, uh, by getting the coat of arms for his father. Yeah. But he never lost the boy who grew up in Warwickshire. Yeah, uh, he never repudiated that, and yeah. that's actually hugely important. Yeah. Well, we see this all over, don't we? I, um, I'm thinking, you know, I would rather be a Shakespeare without the degree in London with these fellows who may be looking down their nose at him, uh, and they were, I think, at first, at least, uh, than one of those fellows who found himself in London unemployed. <laughs> And with with these expectations, having graduated Oxford, Cambridge, with these expectations that, of course, they would be received as the next great uh, poet or whatever they were uh, dreaming of as young men, uh, and, and having to live in poverty and ha have that well, not... It wasn't good for your health. No, it wasn't. Marla dies at 29, Kid dies at 35, yeah. Watson dies in his late 30s, Green dies in his early 30s. And they're all, I mean, it's, it's Nash dies. Uh, in this in this early 30s, I think it's it's a very rough trade, and Shakespeare manages at least to make it into his 50s, uh, yeah. and and ha have a longer, more productive life. Stephen, I cannot express how much uh, I appreciate this, but this will go out to my Japanese colleagues, Shakespeare Society of Japan. You've been here before, I think you've you've spoken at the. I have. I I said at the beginning, and I'll say again. I mean, Japan is one of to me, the one of the most wonderful <clears throat> places on earth. Uh, I've had the I spent a month in Kyoto now years ago, and and I could have become Tom Dabbs and just said I'm going to stay here forever. I mean that I just I was and am amazed by so many aspects of the the unbelievably wonderful food, the astonishing beauty, the complexity and richness of the culture. Uh, and I deeply look forward to a time in which I can return. My wife and I both had the same experience of awestruck pleasure. I've been multiple times now, but not nearly enough 
uh, to Japan. I just adore it. Well, the, the, the feeling is mutual. And I know lots of people who would love to, to see you and hear you speak. And also, you know, if we ever can again, get together for the, the joyous moments of the receptions where things actually happen. You know, you, you, uh, you get to talk with people and, uh, and, the, um, and then uh, they, they call it the second party in Japan. Sometimes you go from the first party to the second party where people are surprisingly honest about things and, and so forth. But uh, yeah. uh, I, I do miss that myself uh, in, over the past two years. Well, may it will I ask happen you again. It will happen again. We'll, we'll, we'll get past this. We, we always will. do. We will. We, we always do. May I ask you to stay for just a moment after we finish recording? And uh, again, thank you so very much. A great pleasure, Tom.